fire and breathe. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I was listening to your conversation. Sorry for, for listening. But um, yeah, there's still countries that there's a pastor for 14 churches. Oh, yeah. And it's amazing that we, uh, we have the blessing of having uh, our church having two pastors. So, and this is in my days too. I mean, very recently I have a friend in Costa Rica that he has a small district and his district are seven, uh, seven churches. So, <laughs> so every, every seven weeks or so he stopped by, have church board and have uh, communion and, and he does everything and then goes to the next one. So, well, good morning. Let's... Uh, Let's open our Bibles and our lessons, and then let's study about this wonderful topic that we've been studying for quite a few weeks now regarding stewardship. You know, this is, this lessons, at least as far as I'm concerned, has been one of the best stewardship lessons that I have ever studied. It's wonderful because it's taking more than just the, uh, the need of being faithful with offerings and, and tithe, but it's way beyond that. Stewardship is way beyond, beyond that. And this, this week, we are getting into another new topic, which is quite interesting. Quite interesting about giving back the rich and the poor and even retirement. So who would like to have a word of prayer? Who would like to lead us in prayer this morning? Not everyone. We just need some, one person to pray. Yes. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of coming to your church to learn more about you. We take it for granted. And when we look around the world, there are many congregations who don't have the roof over their heads, who are persecuted, but we have a comfortable, beautiful church. We can come together in peace and quietness. And Lord, I want to thank you for these privileges. And as we open the word, please send us over spirit to guide and direct us because that's a very important topic for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to wait for a little bit to pass the, uh, the envelope with your offerings. I just... No, just tournament. Just tournament? Yeah. All right. So the memory text, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Ye save the spirit, and they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. So what, what, what is the meaning of this text? What is your understanding of this text? So nobody. So nobody. What happened with these people? Everybody will be safe. No. Okay, that's not what it says, right? That's not what you said either. No, I said, whoever believes in him. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it says here, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. In other words, when you die and have a faith in Jesus, you're blessed. Because you know, it's just a sleep. It's not forever. What about the labors? Resting for, from the labors. Okay. Good point. It can be physically able. Well, in our age, we don't. We have the rest of our physical labor anyway because we retire. Because <laughs> we have that. But there are some other labors, spiritual labors, for instance. We're concerned about our loved ones. Okay. 
okay, so that is also part of it. And then when we die, we don't know anything about it. And then we are at rest. <laughs> because nothing can bother us. Because nothing will bother us, yeah. So the, this, this text is talking about that rest, the rest when, when we go and rest and peace until the Lord comes, which we studied about that last quarter. We did study about that last quarter. But also this text is also has a nice meaning about the rest that we will have when we stop our labor. Retirement. Scary word for me. Why? <laughs> you know, when, I, when I, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, somebody asked me, what are you planning to when you retire? And you know what my answer was? I will never retire. 20 years later, 20 years later, I have a coworker that came to me and said, when are you planning to retire? <laughs> and I'm like, hmm, yeah, good point. Well, the thing is, yes, we retire at a certain age because it's mandatory. But it doesn't mean that our labors will cease. Good point. It's interesting because, because especially in these new generations, People might retire from their current job and starting a new job. Kenton's, Kenton's grandfather told me that he was never so busy until he retired. <laughs> There was no more time for you. <laughs> well, I've been, re I've been retired for who knows how many years, but I still work, okay? Because what do you do at home? Sitting there twiddling your thumbs? It's right. boring. Uh, I, I bet. I bet you can't you can enjoy that for a few days, a few, yeah, few, a few days, days maybe, maybe a week or so, but then after that, what am I going to do now? But the thing is, I don't have to do it. I choose to do it. That's okay. the big difference. Well, that's a good point. So, so when you retire, you may choose to do some other things. You may not choose to do it, but you don't have to go and clock in. It's a big difference. Now, what about, what about retiring financially? He said, that's something that some of us start getting concerned about. It is interesting because this, um, when I got home at one point this week, I received, and I went and checked my mail, there was a letter over there from Social Security. See, when you get into my age, you start getting a whole bunch of information that you didn't request. I'm gonna turn 60 this year. And AARP found me. Every single week I get a letter from AARP, it's like, you're on the edge of looking into this. Some other people start sending me some letters and, um, hey, have you looked into your retirement? By this, I, I, I got a letter from, um, I think it was Edward Jones, that said, by your age, you should have, like, a, like I think it was $1.3 million in your savings account <laughs> to survive your retirement. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Not even close to the $1.3 million. Yes. The interesting thing is, I've received the letters too, but they get too late. <laughs> they get too you late. You can't do anything now. That's right. That's right. The transition from working to retirement can be a very traumatic experience. Yes. The one that I've been getting the last two or three years is from the Neptune Society. Oh, Neptune Society. I really appreciate that one. Uh, okay. My husband said, what's that? And I said, they want to cremate me. That's right. <laughs> So you, you come to a point, you come to a point when the transition from working, regular job that we might be doing, into uh, um, retirement, has it started becoming a reality. I was telling you that I opened this letter from the Social Security and said, hey, if you retire by 65, and it was interesting because <laughs> 
since even though I'm not quite 60 yet, I am going to hold every single minute of this 59. But um, there's a parenthesis, which is going to be in about five years. So, well, I can do the math, Social Security. I can do the math. But this is going to be your retirement if you retire 65. And this is your retirement if you retire 66. And so on, so on, so on, so on. You know. You know, to be honest with you, when I received a letter from Social Security just last week, reality hits on me. Because I can do the math. There's an expectation that within the next five years, what I've been doing for 30, 35 years in my career, starting to coming down. Are we concerned when we get into this? The question is started, do I have enough funds to retire? Oh boy, I haven't fi finished paying my house. And by the time I retired in six, seven years, uh, 427 years, I don't know. By the time I retired, have I finished paying my house? So you start getting perhaps some of us, we might start getting concerned about those days. And I see, I see back over there, pretty young, pretty young people back over there. Is that your kids? See, how old are you guys? Yeah, I'm sorry to pick on you, but you're the youngest in the group. So how old are you? No, no, you're your son. He's 41, man, you look great. Okay, so you guys have no idea where retirement is. You turn around and say, I will never retire. That will never happen. I don't even have a career, right? No, no, him. <laughs> yeah, no, him. 15-year-old, you probably don't have a career. But when you start getting closer and closer and closer, you start getting concerned. What am I going to be doing? It's interesting what Testimonies for the Church says, and this is the lesson on Saturday. All these fears originated from, originated from Satan. All these fears start from Satan. If they will take the position which God will have them, their first last days might be, the, might be their best and happiest. Here's, here's an if. If they, will, if they will take the position which God will have them, the last days will be the happiest. So, when my grandpa, my grandpa used to tell me, um, my grandpa was a pastor, and he was not always a pastor, but um, he started working at 12. Um, he, um, you know, his, his father abandoned mom, and uh, he was the youngest. As the kids grew up, they left the nest, forgot about mom, and uh, he, it was his responsibility to support the house with his mother. Twelve years old. When the time for retirement came for my grandpa, I think he retired at 66, 67. And it was one of those things that was kind of forced retirement. It's like, hey, listen, um, hmm, you have reached the year, and, and now the conference have a retirement plan for you. My grandpa was depressed. He was depressed for many weeks because he felt unvalued, because he felt that nobody really cared about him, because he didn't think he had enough to be able to survive. All these fears originated with Satan. If they will take the position which God will have them, their last days might be their best and happiest. They should lay aside anxiety. Okay, here. 
we should lay outside, outside anxiety for retirement. Continue to say, they should lay aside anxiety and burdens and occupy their time as happy as they can, that they can, and be reaping up from heaven, from heaven. I don't know what's your age. You told me you're retired. You told me you're retired. But if you're up to the point that retirement is coming up within the next few years, like myself, I should put aside anxiety and burdens and occupy my life in being happy because the Lord had this. Um, the, the book, uh, the, uh, the um, SDA commentary page, uh, volume 3, page 1148 says this. Those who have children in whose honesty and management they have ceased to confide should allow them to manage for them and provide for their happiness. So don't worry about it. If you have a kid that is honest... Given that, I know a case that the daughter took everything from the kid, from the parents. They need to go back. And, and by the way, I work with seniors. And uh, I, this is a non-SDA lady, not a Christian lady, as far as I'm concerned. She took everything from them. They put him in a nursing home and walk away. Spirit of prophecy says, for those who have children in whose honesty and management they have ceased to confide, should allow them to manage for them and provide for their happiness. Now, that doesn't mean that you're capable not to do it. It's good to have our brains working on something. It's good to have our brains working. But be sure that somebody is over there to help you when you need it. I keep saying this, unless they do this, unless they do this, uh, we do this and confine our children if they are honest, unless they do, um, sorry, unless they do this, Satan will take advantage of their lack of mental strength and will manage for them. They should lay aside anxiety and burdens and occupy their time and happy as they can and ripping up from heaven. We need to start preparing for that. And we need to start preparing our kids for that. Now, that doesn't mean that you're capable not to do it. But there are some of us that keep that car key, that keeps that wallet... I will write every check until I die. Dad, we don't use checks anymore. We pay it online. I don't know how to write my check. We should need to start preparing our kids. And the kids need to be prepared for that. Because we, as we retire from our, our, our normal labors, according to his prophecy, according to our Bible, we should start enjoying our lives. Here comes the other question. I did not prepare for those days. I, me I messed things up. Let's go to Luke 12, 16 and 21. If you have it, please read it. Luke 12, 16 to 21. Who 
will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God? All right. Interesting, huh? So the Spirit of Prophecy says that we should prepare and, the, and our retirement should be as good and we start enjoying our lives. Yet, we seem to have a little problem with this guy. I think it was a heart condition. Heart condition? I think where his mind was at. So what, what, where was his mind? His mind was all about him, him, him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to store this up. I'm going to sit back. I don't think he was giving. I don't think he was... Wasn't about the Lord's business. Okay, so does it mean that we have to give everything to the Lord to be happy? He owns it all. He owns it all. So, 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 uh, so, should I not prepare for the future? Is it any problem to be rich? Is let's go with this. Is there any problem with God for us to be rich? No. I love that strong no. Better to give. That's true. So that this guy has a problem with the rich people. Well, that's a two-edged sword because it depends what you do with the riches. If you use the riches what you have for serving the Lord, there's no problem. But if uh, the riches become your God, then he has a problem. Well, see, what was the problem with this? And you really nailed it. But what was the problem with this guy? Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency, one. It was not counting on God, right? Secondly, what was he storing things? He didn't have enough barn space to be able to store things. So he was already rich. He just wanted to. More. He just wanted more. And what is he going to do with that? Store it. For what? For the heirs? So there's no problem in working hard and getting wealth. I'm going to give you three. Yes, sir. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to think about that you have also responsibilities. And if you forget the responsibilities, you're in a heap of trouble. Responsibilities to you and to your fellow man. And to God. It reminds me of the other story where the young man went to God and said, Hey, uh, I've kept my I've kept your commandments since a young youth. I've done this and that. What is it that, that I lack? And he said, um, he came up to him and he said, you know, sell what you have and give it to the poor. Because he went away sorrowful because he had many riches and he held those above God. So we established there's nothing wrong to have money. There's nothing wrong to work hard to build wealth, right? Correct. I'm going to give you three names. Three names in the Bible. Abraham. Job. Four. Job. David, Lot. We started about Lot a few weeks ago. And by the way, Lot has a really bad reputation. But I don't think Lot did anything wrong to the fact that Jesus, God, went to pick him up, take him out. Lot would give him a bad rap to Lot, to Lot but he was... Those four individuals measure wealth. What about salt? What about salt? So there's absolute, absolutely no problem with working hard and prepare for the future. Two things, working hard, create wealth, and prepare for the future. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The problem is not working hard. The problem is not working hard or getting wealth. The problem is the attitude towards it. It's mine. It's mine going to keep it, and when I die, it's going to be there. I have enough and have more than enough, and I want more for it. The rich man with a bad attitude. The rich man with a bad attitude is because everything is about me. I want more, and I want more, and I want more. That's the problem with the riches. That's why many of, at least some of us, well, no, 
That's why the Lord doesn't give me more than what I have. Because I probably am not going to use it right. It is possible that many of us cannot handle being rich. It is possible. It is possible that the only way we can be depending on God is when we don't have the money to be able to do the things that we want or need, so we need to depend on God. Otherwise, we'll be like, oh, I don't need God. It is possible that our hearts are not in the right place to be able to manage well. There was no indication that Jesus parallel parable that the rich man was lazy or dishonest. We're not talking about lazy or dishonest. We're not talking about that he didn't work hard. We're not talking about that he was stealing the money from anywhere. It's just that his heart was not in the right place. He was a wealth hoarder. The general picture given in the Bible is that the person works and remains productive as long as he or she is able. You're saying, you retired, you went to do something else. My grandpa, he got out of that depression, and the Lord told him, you know what? You have a good hands for construction. You used to be a carpenter. Go and start building churches. And he went from place to place building churches. And then he fell for feel doing something else that he has not done before. The problem is not working hard. The problem is not that we, that we are not, that we're not supposed to have wealth. The problem is that we are not we should not be providing and keeping uh, some funds to be able to survive the years that we would not be able to work as much. That's not the problem. The problem is what is it going to do with that funds? What are we going to do with that wealth? Can we handle it? Notice this about continue working after you retire. It says, um, as long as we are healthy, we should not, should not mean that we, are, we, that we stop being productive and whatever extent possible, doing some good. Now, I want to read one more thing. If men will do their duty in faithful steward of their Lord goods, there will be no cry for bread, none suffering in destitution, none naked, Naked and in one. What? If men will do their duty in faithful steward of, the, of their Lord's goods, there will be no cry for bread, none suffering destitution, none naked and in, in want. To me, well, the first part, no bread, f fantastic. You know, no suffering, great. But what calls more attention to this, and this is, this is from Parable of the Rich Men, Review and Herald, page 26, 1894. What calls my attention is the last portion, and in want. And in want has more meaning than just the need. Think about it. I need bread. I want a car. Make sense? Needs are something that we need to survive. One, something that we desire. And if we are faithful to God, he says, <laughs> there will be no naked and in one. If we are faithful, of course. It is the unfaithfulness of men that brings about the state of suffering in which humanity is plunged. If those whom God has made as stewards would, would, would but appropriate their Lord's goods in the object on which he gave to them, the state of suffering will not exist. Now, I'm going to... Going to ask you a question, please don't answer. Don't move your head, don't do anything. I really don't want to know. I'm just going to put a question to you. 
Have you always been faithful to God? See, the beautiful about this promise is it doesn't say that if you were not faithful before, that's it. God turns around and says, you know, you're going to pay when you're retired. <laughs> it says that if you are faithful and if your faithfulness starts today, the Lord will remove the suffering. Ask God for forgiveness and be faithful from today on and he will remove the suffering. Are you concerned for the future? Hey, by the way, the stock market apparently is going to crash. Crash, 2008. Economy, it's getting weird. Um, inflation, we love to pay the high electricity and, and gas bills. Every time I go buy some food, it used to be 35 bucks a week, now it's about 60. We love those days, all right? It is our safe, our financial safety is not in the market, is not in what you have in the bank, it's God. And, we are, and if we are faithful to him and his demands and what he requires that is his and our offerings of, of, of gratitude to him, he will take care of us. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to lay down in bed. It's like, hey, yo, Lord, I'm hungry. I'm not going to work. Today's economy, and, and, and if, you, if, you, if you're trying to hire people, it's so difficult. So people doesn't want to work. I don't, I don't know if you have noticed this. People just do not want to work. In our company, we have ser several recruiters hiring for caregivers and nurses. And there's this lady came the other day for an interview. And then um, she's like, I want this schedule. And I was like, well, we don't have this schedule. Because I haven't worked in three years. So I need money. But I want this schedule. Well, we don't have this. Well, I'm not going to work. And she stood up and left. So yeah, I, I told her when she was walking, I was like, I guess you're not hungry enough. Well, people just don't want to work. The Lord intend for us to work as long as we can and, and do it well. I don't think that applies today. No, no, no. No, okay, yeah, of course. I, I did a general statement, right? Of course, there's some, I can tell you, I go to work every day. Yeah, no, it, this is not a judgment. I'm saying that in general, in general, in generalization, people just don't want to do that. But this is, uh, we as a Christian, God has an expectation for us to go to work and to earn it and to depend of him if it's not enough. Well, we're really short-staffed. We can't get nobody to come work for us. There's no, I mean, I see it everywhere. All the trucking companies are hiring and nobody wants to, we're having a bad struggle trying to find people. Yeah, it's, it's a big struggle, but yet, we as a Christian, we should, we should work. But if it's not enough, God knows that. Be faithful to him. Through the, whole, through the whole quarter, we have been studying what God is expecting from us. Tithe, offering, our time, our dedication to him. The time to worship him. This is one thing that was quite interesting during the lessons this week, that God has an expectation for us to have time every single day to study his word. That is part of stewardship. For those who have possessions at the end of life, when you're retired, no matter how great or small they might be, Estate planning can be our final act of stewardship and carefully managing what God has blessed us with. What's that? See, one of the things that was interesting here in the lesson is, is about David. We're not going to read those, those, those texts, but it was about David. What God told David, hey, you're not going to build the temple. What are you going to do? Oh, man, no way. It's not worth it. 
he got depressed and got into his throne and went to bed and he's like, I'm not going to do anything. I hope that Solomon will not be able to build a temple because it was, that, is that what he did? No, no. he prepared everything possible in his power to prepare all the materials so his son could build the temple. He worked for it. He was proactive. Absolutely. He also took all his, all his kingdom and sat down with, with Solomon and said, okay, this is where this is at. This is the money for the temple. This is the money for the food. This is the money for this. And this is the money for somebody to come and take care of me when I get older. And this is the money for this. And he started preparing an estate to say, this is how I want you to do things. Part, part, part of the success of Solomon was the fact that David prepared him for it. How many of us have not prepared for that? When, when, when Kenton was born, our attorney called us and said, hey, what is going to be happening if both of you die? I'm going to tell you, my first reaction when Kenton is small is that what, what, what happens if both of you die today or tomorrow? And I was like, oh, I'm not going to die. I am Superman. What happens if both of you are ended up in an accident? Well, I'm not going to die. I was 29, 30 years old. Invincible. Yeah. You know, Jordan is crazy. Maybe you, because you're older, not me. He called me a few days later and said, okay, I have, I have these things. And he put everything in place for us. Who's going to take care of Kenton when, he, when you passed away? Both of you passed away. What are you going to do? And we had a plan all the way until 23. He suggested 23 because he thought 23 is at, in the age a little bit mature and ready to go. Everything. We told my sister, which is the one that we assigned to take care of the kids, this is what we want you to do if we passed away. I don't know we're going to have this money. The kids have to go to a seven-day Adventist school. And we're having this money inside for that. This is not a choice for us. The kids have to do this. You must take a kids to church every day. And we laid everything down to my sister. Are you willing to do it? She said, yeah. We laid down the state of her in the event that we both die. So what happens now that we're getting older and wiser Wiser, smarter, and, and, and gorgeous, right? When you get older, you're just really, really gorgeous. The, the, these kids don't know yet, but we just get really nice. The white hair gives us such a special face. What happens when you die? You might have a little amount of money in the bank. What would you want for that to happen? You might own a property. You might own a house. Maybe they have to, maybe they have to sell it, but... How do you want for the things to be distributed? Are the kids going to fight? One day my, sis, my parents were talking to us about that and I told my, my sister is older than I. I always had to mention that because she doesn't like it. But I always had to say, yeah, my sister is older than I. And um, I told my sister, when, when our parents leave, you and I are not going to fight for anything. And she's like, no, no, we're not. And I told her, as long as you do what I say, we have no problems. And she's like, yeah. what? What is going to be happening? Many times our kids, our family ended up in a royal fight because we fail to prepare and how the little bit that we are li living gets distributed. Well, that's the reason why we should have a living testament. Living testament, a will, a, um, a um, um, forgot the name for, those, for the other thing that you can do. There's so many things that you can do. 
write it down and say, this is how I want you to distribute it. No fights. It doesn't matter if there is a hundred million dollars or one trillion dollars or 20 bucks. It just doesn't matter the amount. Be sure that you prepare yourself and then you remove from Satan. That you remove from Satan his opportunity to cause division, fights, and separation for God due to for a little bit that you left, they have no idea what actually happened. There is earnest warfare before all you would subdue the evil tendencies that is strive for the mastery. The work in preparation is an individual work. And this is talking about prepare for the future, prepare when you passed away, prepare what's going to be happening with the 20 books of the spirit prophecy that you left that nobody wants. I think I would be more prepared. I mean, the book is important. I have to read that. But I would be more concerned about the spiritual part, teaching it to be a good thing. No, of course, of course. But the division is going to be used because of the wealth. The division between the family is not because of the independent relationship with God. The division is going to be happening for the 20 bucks that were left. And you didn't give me 10. That's where the problem is going to be happening. Let's go to Proverbs 20, 27, 23 to 27. Proverbs 27, 23 to 27. Nobody can read it, it will be great. Anybody? I talk a lot, so. Be diligent to know the state of your flock and attend to your herd, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing, and the goats the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and nourishment of your hands. All right, let's read again the first paragraph. 23, first part. Be diligent. There you go. I, I don't know how, if you have, anybody has sheep or cows or... But what does it mean to be attendance, to know the state or your flock? What does it mean today? I know what about the children. What are they doing? How are they coping with... Think, think about financially. What does it say? Oh, ho, ho. know your financial statements. How much do you have? How much do you owe? How much is coming? How much does it cost to maintain this household? Be sure that you have, you have it organized. How many of us runs the day and the months and the years have no idea what a budget is? No idea how much in food you are spending. Anywhere between 100 and 600? What do you mean you don't know? He says, this is very clear, known well, known well, this is interesting, known well the condition of your flock. Pay attention to your herd. In those days, wealth was related in how much flock you had. How many cows, how many sheep. I don't think dogs counting on it, but no. What is the condition of your flock? What is the condition of your herd? How much do you owe and how much is coming every month? How much you spend in food? How much you spend in gas? And now that the, uh, the heating is so expensive, how much are you spending into that? And how much are you putting in the bank? Well, if you have no idea, how are you going to be able to fix it? 
How are you going to be able to, to tell your kids when you're, oh, well, uh, mm, hmm, you know, I'm getting 100 bucks a month in retirement, but I have no idea how much I'm spending. hey, we got 3% increase in my salary. That reflects this amount. Uh, and so what? Known well the condition of your flock and pay attention to your herd. If you have a problem with that, if you have a problem with not knowing, if you have a problem with how much is this or how much is that, Perhaps it would be a good idea for you to hire an accountant. Or when we when we studied earlier, have one of your responsible, honest kid to help you figure this out. Open a spreadsheet. Here's a simple one. Maintain the checkbook. Yeah, so, so how do you know how much do you have to make a payment? If you have no idea how much is coming, how much is going out. Oh, I have an idea. I have a ballpark. This is like having diabetes and not knowing what your sugar numbers are. How much medication are you going to have? Mm. Roughly, I get left about 10 bucks. For time to time during your earning years, it will be appropriate to review your will and other documents and your present assets and update them as necessary. Not just your will, it's right here. Not just your will, your finances, your savings. If you, if you have 20 bucks in the stock market, did it go to 20 or you're down to one? Thank you. Bank of statements. And if that becomes too much, ask somebody that has some knowledge that you can trust to help you with. To help you with. Look at your documents. So what is going to be happening when you pass away? When I was, well, in, in Costa Rica, well, in Costa Rica, you cannot drive. In case you didn't figure it out. I'm from Costa Rica. I know the accent. I don't have any accent. But... Um, in Costa Rica, uh, you cannot drive legally until you are 18. Not at 16 or anything else. No, at 18 is, is the age. So when I turned 18, my dad said, don't, don't go to college today. I want you to pick me up at 11 in the morning. I have my driver's license. I went to pick up my driver's license the day before. And then I went to pick him up. So we went to lunch together. And then from there, we went to the bank, to the different banks that my dad had a, um, they used to do business with. And he put my name and signature in every single one of his accounts. He also asked a credit card for every single one of the credit cards he had. And he did two more things that obviously I still remember with greatness in my heart. We went to the, to the key making um, place and he made a key of his car. He gave it to me. Anytime you want to use it, here's, here's my car for you to use. By the time we did all this, it was time for dinner. So we went to have dinner and he pulled out a binder and he said, this is what you need to know. Here's our life insurance. Here's this. Here's this. If I died, your mom died, here's where you're going to have, here's a policy for this. Here's where we're going to be buried. And my first thought was, why is my dad dying? Did he cancel him? 
So I asked several questions. He said, I just want you to be aware. I did the same thing with your sister. I want you to be aware what is actually going on. Even up to this day, my, my parents are still alive, which is a great blessing. But even up to this day, my dad still keeps us informed of all the different changes that he has made. When he passed away, I know exactly what is it that he wants. Well, I have not done that to my kids. That's right. What? I'm still thinking that I don't need to. I'm waiting. On <laughs> but after this lesson, I was like, I'm calling Cantor and I'm calling Andrew. It's like, oh, we're going to sit down. We're going to figure out what's going on. It is our duty to be prepared that. Sure, good steward is what God has blessed us with, doesn't deal only with what we have while we live, but also for what happens after you are gone. A stewardship also happens with uh, the wealth that we generated after we are gone. We still have to be steward with that. Satan is using that to create division in our families. And it's our duty to be excellent stewards or anything that we have to be sure their kids, to assure our families that they know what is it that we want and that we have expectations for them not to fight for anything because here's my will. That is part to be a good steward. Now, um, Timothy 6.17, and perhaps, perhaps let, let's, let's go to, yeah, um, let's go first to Timothy 6.17. Anybody can read it, please. Okay. So what's that text? So it's a way to also reintroduce us with the idea that God owns everything and that we have to return to God his, what he demands of us. Don't lose because you have money. Don't forget about your tithes and offerings. Yet, if the Lord has given you more than what you need, don't forget about those that are in need. Don't forget about the church. Don't forget about the different things that the Lord has given us. Don't forget about those kids that are in our, and they are in our schools and unfortunately cannot pay their bill. Perhaps the Lord has impressed you to leave a portion of your wealth for those kids. I believe in education. I, I believe in Christian education. Actually, no. I don't believe in Christian education. I believe in Adventist education. And, and they're not perfect. Our schools are not perfect at all. There are a whole bunch of humans over there running those schools. There are a bunch of hypocrites, just like the ones we're sitting over here today. Let me sit down, too, because I'm a hypocrite, too. But if you want to find a place that compensate for what the home and the, and, and the church can do for our kids, put them in our schools. But there are some of these people do not have the funds to pay for it. But well, why the church school has to be so expensive? 
super expensive. Nothing is special. They're expensive because we do not receive subsidies from your taxes. Whether you have kids or not, whether you're using the school district, and I'm not saying not to send kids to the school district. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what I believe. But whether you have a school district or not, whether you have kids in the school district or not right now, you are paying for whatever schools they have in our district. That's why our schools are expensive. But you cannot find better education than what we found in our schools. And if the Lord has called you to say, when I passed away or before I passed away or when I do my, sta my, my, my state, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to give a little bit of my wealth to help those kids. The parents cannot pay for it. By all means, do it. Don't wait until you die. Do it right now. I don't know that I can give you a list because I don't know who's going to the school. By the way, as a disclaimer, I do not work for the school. Kayla does, but I can guarantee you, in those 80, some kids that we have in Yaks right here, there are some that parents are struggling that we, quietly, without giving our names, can be helping so they can find the God that is in our hearts. So in the Lord, when you're doing, when you're doing your state, when you're doing the distribution, if the Lord impress you to leave something, do it. It's interesting one thing. Um, um, it's interesting how we um, sometimes think about these things, and we want to leave everything to our kids. And, and that's, in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with that. But if the Lord impressed you to do something, that is part of being a good steward. If the Lord doesn't impress you, that's okay. Now, the most important thing, and you said it, the most important thing that we can leave beside our the financials is our spiritual legacy. What is your spiritual legacy? Don't answer me. Now, when I was growing up, he's still alive, so I'm not going to say the name. Who knows somebody who's watching? From, my, from Costa Rica, but we, when, when I was growing up, I had a, um, a deacon. He you, and my, granted, my cousin and I were not the most quiet kids in the church. It's not like we're sitting over there paying attention. One day my mom told us, my parents were active in the worship service, and my mom told us, sit down in the first two pews. So we sit down, my cousin and I would sit down in the, the first two pews in the middle, right here, in front of the whole church. He and I, tell you, I was like 11, so it's not like a, whew, I was six, seven years old. No, 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 I was old enough. I was sitting right here. My cousin and I were just trying to bother each other, and I just kept threatening. No, no. And I took my hand with this knuckle right here and hit him right here in the middle of the muscle. And, and my cousin went like, whoa! Middle of the church started to, what's going on? My dad from upstairs is just looking at me like, a, we will discuss this. <laughs> hmm. But this deacon used to stand right there by us. There was only two, two rows. So over here by the... Uh, by the wall, and he stood out by us, just watching us. Oh, Lord, I could not even move because he was just looking. No, that was not the day. I mean, every, every Sabbath, that was the thing with him. And for me, his legacy was the enforcer. Didn't like him. If I went outside because I needed to go to the bathroom, 
He went behind me to be sure I went to the bathroom. And if I didn't go to the bathroom, he told my parents. His spiritual legacy with me, it was like a, hmm, I don't like this guy. Of course, late, later on when I got a little bit older and the whole thing, I was like, well, he was right. But the way he did it, not nice. What is your spiritual legacy? How are you going to be remembered by the other members of our church? Are you going to give enough money that we can call the Martha and Mary's, the Eduardo Gonzalez room, so we're going to give enough money just to put our name in there? No. But God expects from us and from us, his people, his, his uh, individuals, is for us to be faithful to him. Remember so-and-so? When I was growing up, one day he talked to me about this and inspired me so much that I wanted to do this for God. You may not know when you pass away, but maybe the money that you left for that student or for that school got somebody that today is the pastor of this church, that today is, 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 is an evangelist, that today is the president of this conference. So by all means, maybe he's just someplace else just bringing people to God because the money that you left left a spiritual legacy that made the difference and many individuals year to come. But this is on your relationship with God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, so in summary, some of us are getting older enough that we are looking at the future of retirement as a scary push of our lives. And, and, and if you're not in that group yet, beware, it's coming. Maybe because of illness, maybe because of of divorce, maybe because of different other things, that the time could come earlier. Prepare, be faithful to God, but yet, don't be afraid. Just be faithful to God. God has this. He, 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 he has you. Maybe you need to make plans for the future, and, and maybe you have not seen the, the, the state of your, your, of your of your financials. Maybe you have not seen the financials. Maybe you have no idea where you are. Maybe it's time to do this instead of preparing it, regardless of the age, whether you're 15 or you're 620. It is time to review that. And perhaps ask for help to somebody that can help you with the trust and the, and, the, and the background to be able to assist you. And third, if the Lord calls you, when you're making your statements, when you're making your reviews, if the Lord is calling you, to help, leave a little bit. It doesn't matter. Leave a, deal, a little bit for something that you're passionate about. As you can tell, I'm passionate about, about Adventist education. I believe in that. But if the Lord is calling you for something, whether it's Adventist World Radio, whether it's a camp, like a camp, whether it's whatever you choose to be, do not hesitate to make your plans and return to, the, to God a little bit of the wealth that he has allowed you to make. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this stewardship. 
studies that we have had. Lord, at a time of when retirement is coming or when some circumstances happen, we start getting concerned about our financial futures. We don't know whether we have enough. We don't know whether we have done enough. We don't know if we're going to be working until we're 100 years old. Father, as we study, those concerns come directly from the enemy and not from you. Because you are saying, be faithful to me, and I will take care of everything, even of your wants. Father, help us to understand the need to know exactly where our finances are. Lord, help us to create a budget. Help us to create a system that where we can actually know exactly the real financial situation where we're sending on today. And Father, as we make our plans, help us that if it's not our kids, that somebody can be the the person that's going to lead our wishes. Father, help us to create um, an organized way to say how, I, how do we want our funds to be managed when we are not here. Whether it's much or little, it doesn't matter what. And Lord, if you call us, if you call us to leave something else as a gratitude for you, help us to include it in there so your cause will continue moving forward. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the wealth, whether it's lot or little, that you have given us. And we ask you, Lord, that we can continue to be faithful to you until the day that you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Bill. I love your tie. Thank you. <laughs>